Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and once again, we've got another great and interesting hangout planned for you. Uh, it turns out that people using a ground-based imager uh, in the Gemini Telescope have found the most solar system-like planet ever directly imaged. And today we're going to be talking about that with one of a member of the team who has uh, who has worked on this uh, this results as well as a f talk about a few other things uh, related to these observations but before I get started let me introduce my cohort and my colleague Dr. Carol Christian she's the OPPO project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. Hi Carol! Hello Tony how are you? <laughs> I'm ready for another hangout that's how I'm doing okay. doing great except you may notice an empty spot in our hangout this time so uh, last minute Scott Lewis the driver of the internet got uh, I guess he got evacuated from where he was <laughs> Poor guy. Uh, yeah. California is uh, is an interesting place right now apparently so uh, yeah but anyway he's uh, he may or may not join us during the hangout uh, we'll have to wait and see in the meantime uh, we're gonna have Elena helping us with some of the driving of the internet as well as uh, I will be monitoring all of your questions and comments which let me get to that right now how did how to interact with us we hope that you have some questions for us during this hangout and to, the best way to, to ask them or to, for me to read your comments is to use the Q&A app it's a little button that's in the uh, hangout window there that you can just click on and then you ask your question and then I see it pop up magically here and that that's e that's the easiest way for me to see what you uh, what you want to say and I will read it back and we'll ask our guests uh, whatever it is that you uh, want to know about of course, as always, we're also looking at the Hubble Hangout hashtag on Twitter. Uh, so definitely use that as well. And I'm also looking at the G Plus event page. I'm not looking at Facebook. I'm sorry. I just can't do it all. So I'm not as good a driver as, uh, as Scott is. So I'm not going to be looking at Facebook, but everything else I will be looking at. Also, while I'm at it and telling you about all this social media stuff, you need to subscribe to our social media channels. If you haven't already been doing that, we want you to subscribe uh, at at Hubble Telescope on Twitter or Hubble Site Channel on YouTube. Uh, those are the best way to learn about new Hangouts as they come forth and who wouldn't want to know. So there you go. That's this week. So let's get started. Um, with me, joining me is, uh, is uh, Dr. Marshall Perrin, and he's part of a team of astronomers, including um, many uh, here at the Space Telescope Science Institute, that have used the Gemini Observatories. It's a, apparently a new instrument called the planet, uh, the Gemini Planet Imager, the GPI, uh, to find it, and it has found the most solar system-like planet ever directly imaged uh, around another star. And so here to talk about that, as I said, is Dr. Marshall Perrin. He is an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and he's uh, back on one of our hangouts. Hi, Marshall. Welcome back. Hey, Tony. Thank you very much. N Good nice. To I say welcome back because you did do one of the very early hangouts before yeah. this was way, way before we got started on a regular basis. So yeah, I remember doing one with you talking, I think, about JWST. But uh, anyway, we may, we may get to that a little bit here today. Yeah, I'm actually down at NASA Johnson Space Flight Center right now involved in some JWST optical testing that will be get started over the next week or so. But we'll be talking mostly about the work I'm doing on the ground today uh, with Gemini Planet Imager. But I do work on both missions. That's right. And uh, Awesome. We, yeah, we are probably going to be having you back to talk some more about what you're doing right now at Johnson. But uh, as we, but as you pointed out, we're talking about the work that was done by the Gemini Observatory uh, and their and their something called the Gemini Planet Imager. And and because we usually wait too long uh, in the Hangout to start showing pictures, I want to get to uh, the I want to get to a picture right away. So, Elena, when you get a chance, if you could show us the uh, the image itself, I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have Marshall just sort of describe what we're looking at. And uh, and uh, talk a little bit about this uh, this thing, uh, this planet, which is known as 51 Eridani b. It's about two times the mass of Jupiter, and it orbits its star at about 13 times the distance from the Earth. Uh, the Earth is from the Sun. Is that correct? That's that's correct. So in terms of of comparing to our own solar system, you can think of this as a planet that looks like it's a bit more massive than Jupiter, and is at a distance. Uh, sort of comparable to the the distance of Saturn from the Sun in our own solar system, a little bit further than that. Cool. And here, then this picture here, you can see that. Well, what, I, so this is a direct image of the planet itself. Is that what yes. we're looking at? So, so what that means is, you know, that the challenge of looking at a planet around the nearby star is is not the faintness of the planet. You know, planets are faint, but we can see very faint things with Hubble with other telescopes. The challenge is that it's right next to a star, which is, which is in this case about a million times brighter than than the planet. And so the 
the the whole point of an instrument like the Gemini Planet Imager is to, in essence, be able to point one of the biggest telescopes on the Earth at a very bright star and not see the star, block the starlight out, and so you can see the the planet as this little faint dot. It's it's the dot that is is sort of below uh, the 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 star in the middle, the, the white bright spot in the middle. What you're seeing is the residual starlight that we haven't been able to block out. So in this case, we're, we're blocking out about 99.9999% of, of the starlight. Um, and this is through have, using adaptive optics to correct for the blurring, the, the twinkling, distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere to get a, a sharp image. Then there are optical systems called a coronagraph to, to block the light diffractively. And then furthermore, we take and do a lot of software post-processing to, to clean up the residuals. And so in the end, you, you've, you've blocked up almost all the starlight and you can see this this dot down to the south, uh, and and that is the the planet that we're seeing there. Okay. Well, I want to get back to the imager itself in just a minute, but mm -hmm. right now what we're looking at is the like you said, the center is the star, and this little thing right below the dotted line is another bright dot, which is the planet itself. Yes. Um, and so now you you were saying the biggest challenge in directly imaging a planet isn't how dim it is because we can see dim things, it's how dim it's how bright the star is right next door to it it's, compared it's to the planet. It's dynamic itself. range. That's that's correct. And the, you often hear analogies like like you're looking for a firefly next to the the spotlight of a of a stadium. Yeah. Or or in Kepler's case, it was like a bug going across a headlamp and a car that's so many miles away or something exactly. like that. Exactly. And, and so, you know, a poetic way to think about the comparison of this to, to Kepler is, is that in some sense, you know, Kepler is seeing the shadows of, of planets as they pass between the stars and us. And here we're seeing the, the glow of the planet itself. This is a, a young solar system. This is actually about a, a 20 million year old young Jupiter. So this is a Jupiter that is still glowing hot from its, its heat of formation. Like the young Earth was very molten. And so that actually makes it a bit easier to see in this case. It's still a million times fainter than the star, but that's that's easier. That's an easy case compared to the... Like Jupiter, our own, our own solar system is about a billion times fainter than the sun. If You mean like if you tried to find our if Jupiter? You, if you tried to look from afar to see Jupiter in, in reflected light, you, you would need to see something a billion times fainter than the sun. Wow. Okay. So that's pretty. That's pretty dim. So the just so my I can get my orientation. And that's a that's an important point is that this is reflected light. So remember Jupiter, that that, that B there that dot. What from we're looking at here is is not. This is this is the glow of the planet the, itself. The glow so of the mission. planet itself. Yes. Whereas Jupiter we see because it's reflected light and that's the moon. Correct. And that's and that's what makes this. That's why when we built this instrument. Yeah. You know, it's designed to look for for young planets, young Jupiter-type planets. Is what we can do today with with Gemini Planet Imager and with a few other instruments on the ground that have the same types of technology. And in the future, with with future space telescopes that NASA is now planning, we're looking to be able to push down that additional factor of a thousand or ten thousand, so we can see not just Jupiter twins, but potentially rocky planets or other stars. That's still way off in the future, though. So that that planet then, because it's glowing so brightly, at least it appears like it's glowing brightly in mm -hmm. this picture, uh, is pretty hot then. So what? Yes, that's, that's is right. This, is this infrared we're looking at then? That's right. The image you're looking at there is is near infrared, about one and a half microns, about a factor of three longer wavelength than than visible light. And and this planet is is about 700 uh, degrees uh, Kelvin. So you know, it's that's 400 Celsius more or less. So it's it's warm. You know, it's it's hot as an oven. But, but that's actually cool compared to, you know, if you think about the planets that Kepler sees that are very close to the star at, you know, orbits of a few days, and those might be 1,800 or 2,000 degrees. Those are called hot Jupiters usually, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so this is something that is, you know, cooling towards eventually becoming like, like Jupiter in our own solar system, about 150 Kelvin. Okay, so I can get the geometry right here and make sure I'm getting this right. Are we looking at this from the top down? In other words, is that planet going around... Uh, in a circle, in, like in the dotted line, only further out, or are we look at is it is the geometry somewhat different? So, so the first time you look and you see a planet, you don't actually know that, right? You right. you look at this and you just see one one point. And you know, for instance, the the planet Beta Pictoris, that's also been seen with GPI and with other instruments, is a perfectly edge-on system, and so it's actually moving in, getting closer and closer to the star right right now. In this case, we only have a couple of of times we've seen it. We we first discovered this planet in December. So not even a year ago. Oh, wow. Uh, so this is really recent. It was very recent, yes. Uh, we saw it the first time in December. I was back at the telescope in January, and we were able to take a second set of data in January to detect it then um, but and see that the planet is still there. But that doesn't give us much of, of a, a uh, orbital arc. 
Uh, we're, we're starting to observe it again. It's just coming back into view. It was unable to be seen throughout the, the summers on the wrong side. Of, you know, it was, it was not, the star wasn't up at night. Uh, we're starting to be able to get back into the observing season, so we'll be down uh, following it up this, this fall. I'm going to be going to the telescope again in about a month for more observations. And so as we get more uh, observing points, we're going to start to see it trace out its orbital arc around the star. But of course, at this point, you know, it's far enough from the star. Saturn in our own solar system is about 30, degree, 30 years to go around the sun. This planet's probably something like 40, 45 years to, to orbit its star. So we're only going to see a little bit of motion over the last year, but that will let us start to figure out what kind of inclination uh, the, the, the planet has around the star. So things and like that's, this. That's an of... important point about, to verify that it is a planet because, it, you know, there, it could be a background faint object. Ah, but, 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 but in this case, this, this is a very important uh, dis distinction of what we've been doing with GPI. In, in the past, yes, you find one dot and, and you start to say, well, maybe that's a, that's a background star. But one of the things that sets GPI apart from other instruments is that this, we're showing this as an image, but GPI is not just an, an imager. It's an imaging spectrograph. And, and so, in fact, what we have is, is not just a, a picture of this, but we have pictures at many different wavelengths, and we can put those together to measure the spectrum of the planet. And that's actually one of the other figures that we have available. It's an animation of, of the spectrum of the planet. And if, if we bring that up, uh, we, we can show it. And, and this is what actually enables us to say, just with a, a single epoch, single observation, the, the spectrum, the, the light of this planet, is, has the spectral uh, pattern, not of, of a background star, which is more like a black body, but has this very sharp uh, spectral feature as methane absorption. Um, so not this one. This is the, the image, I think, the, the, there's an animation that just shows the spectrum of the planet and the image to this, the side of it. Yeah, that was the second one we looked at. So it yeah. is. The, so it's a spectrograph. So just to clarify, it's a spectrograph. So it's a spectrograph, or it's a series of images. It. It's a the series. The way that the instrument works, the the spectrograph. And I was part of the team that, that built the spectrograph before I came to Space Telescope. I was at University of California, Los Angeles, and we were building the imager there. You form the image on what's called a micro lens array, and it's a little piece of glass that has has physical pixels in it. Little, each individual pixel is a lens, and, you, and it chops up optically the light uh, into the individual pixels. Instead of doing it in a detector, it chops it up optically, and then we disperse each of those into a spectrum. And so the raw data is actually about 36,000 spectra. Each pixel is, a, is an entire spectrum of an, across an infrared band. And so we then reassemble those, and we get a, a spectral data cube. And instead of an image, you're all familiar with, with regular digital camera images that have RGB, three colors make up an image. We're, we're getting about 20 channels of light in a single image for every pixel in the, the whole field of view. So we're kind of going in and out of the data cube then when you kind of, when you move this animation, right? You're right. moving from and one so wavelength all the way showing, down through. Yeah, the image there is showing the different wavelengths of, of the data cube, and then the 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 dot that's moving along in the spectrum plot there is sort of just showing which wavelength you're at. And if, if you look at where the, the planet is, you'll see that it's, it's bright at these wavelengths, and then suddenly it gets very dim as you go to longer wavelengths. Mm. And let's, do, let's look at that again. So, so here we'll see yeah. at these wavelengths, the planet pops up nice and bright, and then down it goes, gets very faint. And, and that signal, which is very similar to the spectrum of, of Jupiter in our own solar system, is a signal of, of methane absorption in the atmosphere. And that's not something that you see in stars. And so the answer is no, this can't possibly be a, a background star because it has the spectrum of a planet. And you can see that right away in a single yeah. epoch. Okay, cool. so that's really interesting. And just before we leave this, leave it up for a second yeah. longer, uh, Elaine. I want to make sure people understand. This is kind of complicated. For every pixel on this image that you see in the square on the left is an entire, there's depth to each one that is that has a, a different wavelength that we're stepping through with uh, with those numbers on the right. And so that's, that's uh, uh, why we're calling it a data cube. And you can see here that they've also blocked out, or uh, the, 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 the star itself has been uh, masked out, or at least the... Uh, the light from that particular star. Now, this was done while the image was taken, right? So there, there is both physical blocking of the light from the star via a, a complex series of masks in, in the instrument, uh, and then there's also additional software processing and blocking that happens after the fact, and you sort of stack up different levels of filtering to get that, that many factors of 10 rejection of the starlight that we're going for. Okay. And no one tool can do it all at once. It's, it, fits together. You know, first some blocking with the AO system, then more with the chronograph, then more with the integral field spectrograph, then more with software at the end. And each stage 
buys you a little bit of the suppression of the starlight that you need. Okay. So I also have the impression that if I kind of get away from the screen, that that I mean it may be my imagination, but it seems like as you step through these, you can actually see the planet brighten and that the the scattered starlight is different. It doesn't. Yes, the, the scattered say, starlight. Hey, that would. Does that help? Say absolutely. Oh, and that, and that's part of. I've, I've been skipping over the details of how we do the the software. <laughs> post-processing, right? And everybody's sure. seen, you know, the, on, on TV you have CSI and you say enhance image and all the noise yeah. goes away and you get a crisper <laughs> image. And in reality you need, need something to help you do that. And we use the way that the light of the planet changes or the way that the light of the star changes as a function of time, as a function of wavelength. And those all go together in uh, complex post-processing algorithms developed in part at the in at Space Telescope, developed in part by our, our colleagues in, in Canada and in, in Europe. It's a big international collaboration. And so all those go together to, to process. And there's a bit of an art to that. And in terms of how you adjust the settings on that, if any of you have done you know, adjusting your own images in Photoshop, you can move a dial too far to the side, and you bring out the noise, and you make it look not as good. And so there's a bit of a, an art to bringing out the signal to noise and really getting to see the planet crisply without over-subtracting or over-enhancing it. And we've been able to you know, develop the mathematical techniques to give us confidence and assess that and let us say this is how much enhancement you can do and then still get the, a reliable measurement of the, the signal of the planet. And, the and, of the planet. and just one other question for clarification. So all the blue and black stuff we see is just background. For the most part, yeah, just background noise and, and the, the scattered starlight and the little blips of noise yeah. that, that, that don't get cleaned up by the processing. Yes. Right. So you've taken this information, these data, the the images, the uh, the data cubes, as we've we've already outlined, and you guys have put together kind of an animation that uh, sort of simulates a lot of it, simulates the system, at least what we know about it so far. Uh, so Elena, yeah, if you I, could... I should set the context of okay, the, the star system a little bit. You know, this is actually a very interesting solar system. Uh, it's it's a star that's that's a few times more massive than the sun. Uh, it's not so far away, about 100 light years away, but we, we already know about the star. There's actually a complex environment there. It's not just this planet. We know that there are two belts of, of dust and debris around the star. Uh, that, that one is, well, it's not something we can see directly yet, but you can infer from the extra infrared glow seen with Spitzer and, and with other uh, telescopes that there must be both warm dust and cold dust. And think of like our own solar system. There's an asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt, warmer and colder dust. And then, in addition, this star actually has uh, two neighboring uh, co-moving stars. It's a binary M-dwarf system, and that's out at, at several thousand AU, and that's moving along with, with the same star. So you can think of it, this, this animation that we'll see um, is, is going to show sort of an animation putting that all together, going to this star 100 light years away, and showing all those different components of the solar system. And this, so I should say, was put together by collaborators and her team at Arizona State University. Cool. Well, she's getting that together for us uh, right now. So let me ask you while she... Oh, there it goes. She's got it up now. Great. All right, so here's the fly. Here's a simulated uh, fly-through. We should have music. Yeah. Right, so this is seeing the, the outer dust belt and, and then the inner dust belt going by there. So just like Jupiter is between the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt in our own solar system, this planet turns out to be between the, the inner and outer dust belts uh, in, in the 51 Eridani system. Yeah, that looks really good. We are good. coming in to see wow. the, the planet itself. And this is an artist's conception showing, you know, that, that this is, it, it looks like Jupiter. Of course, we're just speculating the banded structure, but that fits yeah. with our understandings of what a, a gas giant atmosphere would, would look like. And do we know anything about these, uh, the with the, um, I'm, I'm kind of, showing my uh, ignorance on the planetary scale, on the planetary uh, system scale here a little bit, but aren't Jupiters, don't they, when they're, whenever they're in a part of a system, don't they kind of uh, play a role of clearing out lanes for other planets to form, or at least shepherding stars, or shepherding it, gas and dust, or is that happening here in this, uh, in this well, system? Well, it's, it's certainly suggestive of something like that. You know, this is a case where we don't have that many examples, but to see this system and, and see it look like you know, a scaled-up version of our own solar system, a bit bigger star, a bit more massive planet, these, these inner and outer dust belts, just like our own solar system. And, and we do see, in many cases, evidence where they have these rings of dust around stars, but we can't yet see the, the planets inside that may or may not be sculpting them. And this is a case where we can see 
here, here is a planet that we think is, is perhaps shepherding material, dividing, clearing out the area between the inner and outer belts, just like Jupiter in our own solar system has cleared out the area, you know, right outside of the asteroid belt and helped sort of keep the asteroid belt where it is. You know, and, and understanding how these, these play out over time, the, the past history of the solar system is, is certainly an ongoing area of research. And similarly, I think, you know, with, with GPI, I should say, you know, we found this as part of an ongoing survey. We were looking at hundreds of nearby stars to try to find things like this, to get more examples of this kind of, of solar system to compare to our own. And, you know, you, you, have, you have Kepler that's really pr probing the inner regions, the, the planets that are very close to the star. Direct imaging is probing the outer regions, planets on wider separations. And, and the hope is that eventually we'll sort of, these different set data sets will meet in the middle and we'll have a complete picture. Okay, well, let me push you on that just a little bit. Yeah. So this direct imaging idea, uh, is there a limit to how close you can get to a star, star so far? Are we only looking at things outside, I mean, this is outside the orbit of Saturn, uh, 10 AU that's, or so, I think right, I recall. Yes. yes, and it does get harder as, as you get closer and, and closer to to the star. And and in terms of how um, how close you can get, to get a little bit technical here, uh, there, there's what's called a diffraction limit. The, the, this is sort of this characteristic size of a detail you can see with a telescope. And the bigger a telescope you have, the, the finer uh, details you, you can see. The closer, you, the smaller the diffraction limit gets. And with the technology for blocking out starlight that we have, you have to be further than a, than a few diffraction limits. So let's say four, you know, three or four diffraction limits away from the star. In the case of Gemini, that ends up being about 0.15 arc seconds. But uh, wait a so minute. It, 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 this is a ground-based telescope, isn't yes. it? Is it truly diffraction limited, or is it yes, absolutely? This, this uses one of the most sophisticated adaptive optic systems on the planet. There is a deform. There's actually two deformable mirrors running at a kilohertz, and this is a little, little actuator about it's an inch across, but it still has several thousand actuators that are pistons that are moving at, at a thousand times a second to compensate for the the structure of the atmosphere. We're using the starlight in the middle of the field, the light from the star, the optical photons we send and we use those to measure the distortion, the twinkling of the atmosphere, correct that a millisecond later, and that's keeping the, this image. And we're actually getting JWST-like image quality in terms of, of the, the diffraction limited resolution, the wavefront error, okay. a lot of the technical metrics I, we use. I promise we'll come back to that because I want to yes. talk about it some more. Yes. But I, I, I just want to get back to this point. Because it's diffraction limited, and we'll get more into mm -hmm what that means using how you do it on the ground with the with the uh, adaptive optics in just a bit. But the, the limit that you can get uh, is, you said, three to three or four diffraction limits? That's, that's, that's right. I don't and, understand, and I don't understand so, the unit. What does that unit mean? Well, the, the reason that that's, that's the unit is it actually depends on, on the wavelength. It's sort of the ratio of the wavelength of light you're using to the the size of the telescope, and so okay. GPI so actually physical, can go you know, one micron to two and a half microns. Yes. Yeah, so, so the physical scale, you can think of this as as we can see planets in to you know 0 0.2, 0 0.3 arc seconds, and and that sort of is a good good ballpark number. In this case, the planet is a bit further than that out. It's it's not at our very innermost working angle. It's about 0 0.4, 0 0.45 arc seconds. And that's certainly part of as as we look to improve these instruments and build better ones in the future. Pushing closer into the star and pushing to fainter things is is the technological challenge. So we either can make bigger mirrors or go to shorter wavelengths to do better. Shorter wavelengths would make it you can get you can see closer in, but the problem is as you go to shorter wavelengths, it gets much much harder to do the adaptive optics correction. Okay. And and so to go to shorter wavelengths, it would really help to have a system like this above the atmosphere, a system in space. Okay, so you said that you did this. This uh, system was or this so planet. just just little a commercial, um, oh. which Marshall can talk to as well. Is that this is why astronomers are interested in having a big, short wavelength that is optical and UV in space in the future. So that's, that's right. the commercial and, break. And, okay, uh, go on. <laughs> But and we and we also uh, we've talked about this before too, Carol. That, that Hubble is one of the uh, only games in town for the UV uh, wavelengths right now, anyway, in space. Right, so, but it's yeah. we you know astronomers like to have bigger, bigger. Yes, I know much so, bigger. So the the game plan that we're looking at right now, about ten years out, there's a telescope called W First that's under design and, and study right now, and that's a Hubble-like instrument, Hubble-sized telescope, two point four meters. So it's not bigger, 
but it would put a system like this in in space. You know, most of what that mission will be doing is very wide field imaging. And there will be a second instrument that does GPI-like exoplanet imaging, and that would be pushing still for Jupiter's. Uh, down to that factor of a thousand I talked about before to see reflected light Jupiters, maybe Neptune-sized planets, but not to get to Earth's. Can't get close enough to the star to see Earth's. That would take something like, depending on who you talk to and how optimistic you want to be, a 8 to 10 to 12 meter telescope that might be our, our flagship in the 2030s. Okay, so now I, we've you've you discovered this planet. You said back in January, as part of a or was it December, as part of a survey that you were That's looking right. at. So presumably, you were looking at large areas of the sky already with Gemini, and then this L looking at. You know, this is an instrument that's designed to look at individual stars, right? The whole field of view of the instrument is just a few arc seconds. Oh, good. Okay. One okay. way to think about this is our entire field of view. That whole area that we were seeing uh, in the images we were before is smaller than a single pixel of a Spitzer telescope. Right. We're yeah. we're zooming way in on a tiny region. So we've been surveying uh, 100 stars, let's say, so far, but we're only seeing an area right around each of those stars. Okay, so this was a uh, so this is something that presumably you're going to go back to looking at now that it's back in the night sky again. One of yes. the uh, limitations, yes. apparently, of ground-based telescopes is you got to kind of wait for things to line up so you can see them in the night sky. Uh, the and the how I mean we've talked you've, we've we've touched on comparing it with W first and some of the space telescopes out yep. there, but is are you given for the diameter of uh, the Gemini telescope? Are mm -hmm. you pretty much as good as a space telescope, and 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 I want to go into a little bit more about how you were you were uh, correcting for the atmosphere. So you said you look at the starlight itself, yes, and, and you measure it, and then somehow within a what is it milliseconds later, millisecond, you correct it, and then def basically undistort the the light rays from the atmosphere. That's right, and you can think about this like like your noise canceling headphones, right? It's measuring the light, or, you know, just the way the noise-canceling headphones listens to the sound and then puts sort of the opposite of that sound out, and that's what cancels the, the noise out. So we measure the distortion of the starlight, and then we do the opposite of that. You can think of the, the atmosphere as some ripply pattern that, that bends, and we put the opposite of that pattern on this deformable mirror in the telescope, and that cancels out, and you get a very crisp, flat, sharp image. And... In, in doing that, you know, we're working with a lot of uh, pretty advanced technologies, but this has now been in use, adaptive optics on the ground, for, you know, 10, 15 years, really 20 years since the early developments of adaptive optics. And, and it's really sort of gone into two different directions. One is trying to correct for big, wide parts of fields of view, uh, and that would use lasers to correct the atmosphere, whereas what we're doing is the opposite direction, really doing the best possible correction but for a very small area. And so that's why we don't use, a lot of people think lasers with adaptive optics, but in this case, GPI was designed, there's always going to be a bright star in the middle of the field of view, because we're always looking for planets, there's always a star right there. Let's use that starlight as, as the source to, to we measure the atmosphere. So it just so happens that this particular science problem involves a bright light source that you can use yes. handy already in the field of view. Why not Absolutely. use it to correct? Is that a, is it fat? It seems to me like you can do a better job of a tiny area of the sky getting rid of the atmosphere than you would, say, a big swath. That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. Well, you know my next question then. Why are we even bothering with space telescopes? Why not just do this uh, instead of launching all these expensive, this expensive hardware in space? Well, there's, there's really several different factors to that. And one is, is the sensitivity. Even looking through the atmosphere on, on the ground, you lose some photons in that. And in space, you have different wavelengths you have access to. And you can actually see, with a, with a cold telescope in space, much fainter things. You know, J JWST, even though JWST will be a slightly smaller telescope than Gemini, at these wavelengths it's going to be factors of 50 to 100 more sensitive because it's cold, because it's in space above the atmosphere. And then of course you have the ability to uh, look at things uh, at any time of the year. You're not blocked by, you know, we have weather problems, we have, you know, all, all sorts of issues. Um, but, you know, the other part is, is the wide field observations, right? GPI is able to get, as I said, image quality like JWST for this, this tiny little postage stamp area in the sky. JWST will do it for a much bigger area, W first for yet another factor of, of 100 bigger an area. So it's still, no, there, there's still a lot more versatility in a space telescope compared to, say, a ground-based telescope trying to do this kind of work. There, there's, I mean, versatility is an interesting word. There's, there's versatility on the ground to try out and experiment with new technologies. 
and, and sort of hone the prototypes and make things work robustly that will then later make their way in, into space. And I think that's, that's a very important partnership we have. But, but space will always win for sensitivity, for seeing faint things. And, and again, you know, the, the, the limit we're hitting now with blocking out the atmosphere, the best we can do right, is, is we're getting to this factor of seeing like about a m factor of a million fainter than the star. We think we can push maybe another factor of, of 10 down, especially if we get some of the, you know, looking ahead to the 30 meter telescopes, maybe you're down at 10 million times fainter than the star. I'm glad you brought but, that up. I was just about to but, go there. <laughs> but 10, 10 million times fainter than the star is not where we want to be. We want to be 10 billion, with a B, times fainter than, than the star. And that's what we think it will take to see terrestrial, rocky planets around nearby stars. And, and doing that is something that's only going to be possible from space. There's no way to correct the atmosphere uh, fast enough to get that level of contrast for beyond Sirius and Alpha Centauri and the handful of very brightest stars in the sky. Okay, well, well I, I also wanted to point out that, like, Hubble, we often say that Hubble, you know, Hubble Deep Field or something like that, it's like looking through a soda straw. This is like looking through a pipette. We cannot do everything at that at Absolutely. that resolution. So there are all different scales of astronomical problems. Not everything requires that, you know, there are other problems that require much bigger scale. Yes. So yes. it's very complementary, very complementary science. And, and I think it would be hard in, in this particular object to actually map out that whole system using this particular instrument. So, right. Yeah, we've all seen the post-it stamps uh, size uh, mosaics of the Hubble images. Like for the fat, the fat image, for example, of M31 was put together by just hundreds of little tiny images and pointings of the Hubble. So. Right. So. Okay. Okay. Well, Andrew Planet has a related question here. Let me just go ahead and get him in this. He's asking, will we be able to directly image more exoplanets more accurately with the building of larger telescopes? Is resolution better with telescopes that are in outer space or ground space, ground based in ratio to size. So we talked about that briefly a while ago. Large, one of the things about diffraction limited seeing, one of the things that affects that in addition to wavelength is simply the mirror size. So yes, you could, but you said there's limits on the ground. Yes, yes. So, and so you can imagine, let's say we have a telescope, the 30 meter telescope, uh, or, or let's say the, the giant Magellan telescope that's planned for, for down in Chile, and that's going to be three times larger diameter than, than Gemini. It's going to be 24 meters rather than 8 meters. And so that three times bigger diameter, all else being equal, is going to let you see a planet of the same brightness three times closer to the star. And so you can see planets of the sort of the same brightness but, but moving in, you know, get it, that, that region of where the starlight is blocked in the middle gets, gets smaller. Whereas the telescopes in space will I think will be better at, at pushing the to lower and lower brightness levels, but it will be a challenge to have those get too close to the star. So sort of one has an advantage in, in what we call inner working angle, the ability to get close to the star. The other has the advantage in contrast, the ability to see very faint things. So I think they're complementary. There's certainly room for both the, the big ground-based telescopes and the, the space telescopes to make a lot of advances. Well, one of the things I like the most about what you were saying about that is how these are, it's easy to build test beds on ground-based telescopes and then see how they would work to set the stage for, for putting them on a space telescope platform kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I like that idea. So I want to talk a little bit about Gemini itself, the observatory. Where is it? Yeah. So Gemini is, is down in, in Chile uh, in, in near a town called La Serena. This mm -hmm. is, if you know your South American geography at all, it's, it's about an hour's flight north of Santiago, the capital of, of Chile. And, and many people may have heard there was an earthquake there yesterday. I've talked to a number of people at the observatory and colleagues there, and people are, for the mo most part, doing okay, no damage at the observatory. I mean, it's, it is a, there are people in South America that, that lost their, their lives and lost their homes, so it, my heart goes out to those, those people. But the observatory is actually oh, that's in great shape. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, it's, it's at about... Uh, 3,000 meters, about not quite 9,000 feet, uh, in a mountain in the, in the Chilean Andes. It's close to the Cerro Tololo Observatory. It's a beautiful place, just surrounded by mountains, uh, wonderful countryside. It's a lot like, uh, if you think about Southern California, like, like Palomar or the mountains. They're very dry, very arid, great place for a telescope. Yeah, I was at Cerro Tololo, and I was. It reminded my first thought was New Mexico is what it reminded me. I was a lot yeah. like the, the the American Southwest. Now we were you were saying that this is relevant to the uh, images that we've been talking about because the 
uh, they were in the, as you mentioned, the near infrared. And there are, turns out, one of the things that we need uh, in, to be able to image on Earth, on ground, on the ground, with uh, with this in these wavelengths, is a very dry atmosphere. That's why you see these desert-like environments. Uh, the Andes and Chile happen to be a very dry area because the atmosphere absorbs a lot of infrared in the water vapor lines. So if you get rid of water vapor, you get more infrared light through. Uh, one of the other is just one more challenge uh, of using a ground-based telescope. But uh, and Mauna Kea on Hawaii is also a very dry uh, environment, which is why you see a lot of observatories being built there. There, there is a Gemini observatory, in and there is one that is. There's also one. There's two. There's that one. In hence, there's, there's, hence Gemini, the twins. That's that's <laughs> right. And and uh, right now we we built a planet imager designed it to work for for both. It's in the south right now, and, and will remain there for for at least the next few years. We've certainly talked about. Uh, potentially sort of let's say 2019, maybe take it off the telescope, do some upgrades, give it an overhaul, ship it to Gemini North oh. for the next three, four years after that. So that it, it may it may yet spend time at both Geminis. But so far, you know, the, the timeline here, this is an instrument that we started to design uh, sort of the mid, mid 2000s and we brought it to the telescope. There's years of development, uh, mostly team out of California and Canada, uh, New York, uh, Space Telescope, a uh, wide variety of people. And we, we sort of completed the test and brought it to the telescope in the fall of, of 2013. So just about two years ago exactly, we were just unpacking and setting it up at, at the telescope. And then used it the first time fall of 2013 and spent a year testing it out, getting it working, getting some first science results. And then uh, in November 2014, so about just about a year ago, was when we started the campaign officially. And it's actually, we're not just using it ourselves. It's open to any astronomer to propose and get time on like any other facility instrument. You know, you know what's embarrassing, Carol, is I've known about I've known about Gemini for many many years, and this is the first time I ever made that connection that there were two of them. Hence the word <laughs> Gemini. <laughs> I didn't know why it was called Gemini. I just, that's embarrassing. But it makes perfect sense. Okay. I think we do might have a picture of the the telescope here that we can bring up. We can see G Pi on on the back where the telescope it might take a second to to bring that up. Um, okay. All yeah, right. It's, it's, yeah. So this is an interesting telescope. So what we're looking at here, this is actually the the, the back end of the telescope. The yep. mirror is, is pointing away from us, and the the instruments Gemini all hang on the back of of the telescope. There's sort of a cube in the middle you can see there, which has five different faces that instruments can be hung off. And so GPI is is the one on the, the bottom. You can see the uh, sort of black and and dark blue box hanging down. It's about the size of of a car. And then it's got these two brighter blue boxes on either side, which have all the computers and electronics in them. And so it's on the bottom, and the light from the telescope goes down to it there. Oh, okay. Um, oh, John, I got I just got to ask this question. So John Glasgow on the Q&A app. The real question is, how long would it take a galaxy-class starship, <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> Enterprise, to arrive at this star system going at its max cruise speed of warp 9.2? And then he gives a nice little equation for the velocity. Well, you know what, John? I'm going to leave this as an exercise for the viewer. And when you get a chance, if you could show us the uh, the image itself, I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have Marshall just sort of describe what we're looking at, and uh, and uh, talk a little bit about this uh, this thing, uh, this planet, which is known as 51 Eridani B. It's about two times the mass of Jupiter, and it orbits its star at about 13 times the distance from the Earth. Uh, the Earth is from the Sun. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. So in terms of, of comparing to our own solar system, you can think of this as a planet that looks like it's a bit more massive than Jupiter and is at a distance uh, sort of comparable to the, the distance of Saturn from the Sun in our own solar system, a little bit further than that. Cool. And here, then this picture here, you can see that, well, what, I, so this is a direct image of the planet itself? Is that what yes. we're looking at? So, so what that means is, you know, the, the challenge of looking at a planet around the nearby star is, is not the faintness of the planet. You know, planets are faint, but we can see very faint things with Hubble with other telescopes. The challenge is that it's right next to a star, which is... Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and once again, we've got another great and interesting hangout planned for you. Uh, it turns out that people using a ground-based imager uh, in the Gemini Telescope have found the most solar system-like planet 
ever directly imaged. And today we're going to be talking about that with one of a member of the team who has uh, who has worked on this uh, this result, as well as a f talk about a few other things uh, related to these observations. But before I get started, let me introduce my cohort and my colleague, Dr. Carol Christian. She's the OPPO project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. Hi, Carol. Hello, Tony. How are you? <laughs> I'm ready for another hangout. That's how I'm doing. Okay. Doing great. Except. You may notice an empty spot in our hangout this time. So uh, last minute, Scott Lewis, the driver of the internet, got—I uh, guess he got evacuated from where he was. <laughs> we'll talk about that, as I said, is Dr. Marshall Perrin. He is an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and he's uh, back on one of our hangouts. Hi, Marshall. Welcome back. Hey, Tony. Thank you very much. N Good now, to be here. I, I say welcome back because you did do one of the very early hangouts before yeah. this was way, way before we got started on a regular basis. So yeah, I remember doing one with you talking, I think, about JWST. But uh, anyway, we may, we may get to that a little bit here today. Yeah, I'm actually down at NASA Johnson Space Flight Center right now involved in some JWST optical testing that will be get started over the next week or so. But we'll be talking most about the work I'm doing on the ground today uh, with Gemini Planet Imager. But I do work on both missions. That's right. And, uh, awesome. We, yeah, we are probably going to be having you back to talk some more about what you're doing right now at Johnson. But uh, as we, but as you pointed out, we're talking about the work that was done by the Gemini Observatory uh, and their and their something called the Gemini Planet Imager and. I, because we usually wait too long uh, in the hangout to start showing pictures, I want to get to uh, the. I want to get to a picture right away. So let's. Okay. Uh, yeah. California is uh, is an interesting place right now, apparently. So uh, yeah, but anyway, he's uh, he may or may not join us during the hangout. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. In the meantime, uh, we're going to have Elena helping us with some of the driving of the internet, as well as uh, I will be monitoring all of your questions and comments, which let me get to that right now. How to, how to interact with us. We hope that you have some questions for us during this Hangout, and to, the best way to, to ask them or to, for me to read your comments is to use the Q&A app. It's a little button that's in the uh, Hangout window there that you can just click on, and then you ask your question, and then I see it pop up magically here, and that, that's, e that's the easiest way for me to see what you, uh, what you want to say, and I will read it back, and we'll ask our guests uh, whatever it is that you uh, want to know about. Of course, as always, we're also looking at the Hubble Hangout hashtag on Twitter. Uh, so definitely use that as well. And I'm also looking at the G Plus event page. I'm not looking at Facebook. I'm sorry. I just can't do it all. So I'm not as good a driver as, uh, as Scott is. So I'm not going to be looking at Facebook, but everything else I will be looking at. Also, while I'm at it and telling you about all the social media stuff, you need to subscribe to our social media channels. If you haven't already been doing that, we want you to subscribe at at Hubble Telescope on Twitter or Hubble Site Channel on YouTube. Uh, those are the best way to learn about new Hangouts as they come forth and who wouldn't want to know. So there you go. That's this week. So let's get started. Um, with me, joining me is, uh, is uh, Dr. Marshall Perrin, and he's part of a team of astronomers, including um, many uh, here at the Space Telescope Science Institute, that have used the Gemini Observatories. It's a apparently a new instrument called the planet, uh, the Gemini Planet Imager, the GPI, uh, to find it, and it has found the most solar system-like planet ever directly imaged uh, around another star. And so here to